and um, more um, attempt to prove the external world. Um, it one thing they have in common is that Chisholm, like Moore, is effectively endorsing a common sense approach to skepticism and appeal to common sense. Um, but the place where they sort of intersect the most is that Chisholm is insisting that we have specific, particular cases of knowledge. There are particular things that we know. Um, there are particular, we can give examples of particular instances, cases of things that we know. And one of Chisholm's most clear examples is the Morian thing. Here's one hand and here's another. I know this is a hand. I know this is an all, another hand. These are particular instances of knowledge. So Moore was offering particular instances of knowledge and uh, Chisholm thinks of these as, per, as good examples of what he means by particular instances of knowledge. Now what Chisholm does is um, he thinks that you can start with these particular instances of knowledge and then build your epistemology, um, but also thinking this through, it has implications with respect to skepticism. Now, with more it was more natural to think that he was responding to radical external world, brand the vat, evil demon type skepticism. Chisholm developed his approach in response to another skeptical position or skeptical argument uh, that we looked at in the Peronian skeptics, uh, the problem of the criterion. So what I'll be going over today is Chisholm's response to the Peronian problem of the criterion, which is basically the circularity and infinite regress problem. So I'll just remind you of that. Um, when I spoke about skepticism a couple of weeks ago, um, I spoke about, in the first lecture, about ancient Greek skepticism. I contrasted the academic skeptic who simply denies that knowledge is possible in a seemingly incoherent way, uh, and the Peronian who seems to adopt the more moderate and coherent view that you could, or arguably coherent, that you can suspend judgment. And the way the uh, Peronian approached this was by presenting a series of cases in which we perceive the world one way, but then there can be an opposed perception of apparently the same entity or phenomenon. Um, and they put up lots of cases where perceptions can be opposed to each other. So seeing a tower uh, and it looking round and seeing it looking, at, looking square, uh, looking at a stick and it looks bent in water and straight when removed and so forth. Um, and what the Peronian is expecting or is hoping will happen is that you're pushed to a place where you have to suspend judgment because you don't know which perceptual input, input uh, to give any credence to. Now, the Peronian then considers that you might be able to work with what they call a criterion. A cri often this would be called a criterion of truth, but for today it's really a criterion of knowledge that we're interested in. Um, well, you'd use some criterion to work out what to believe. You've got these opposing perceptions, you've got different beliefs that would be based on these perceptions. We need a criterion to tell us which belief, uh, based on which perception, is the correct one to accept. So you, the idea is to articulate some neutral criterion. Have we seen any neutral criteria? I would propose that Descartes' idea of clear and distinct ideas would be a criterion. And the empiricist idea that you should base your beliefs about the world on immediate sense experience might offer us a criterion. But the question then is, this is the Peronian question, how do you justify any criterion that you're proposing? So you propose some standard or criterion which you use to justify your beliefs. The question is, what justifies that? And here's the problem which is usually called the problem of the criterion. Though, as we'll see, uh, Chisholm tends to call it by another name. Um, the problem is this. You want to appeal to a criterion, or a standard, or a principle, or whatever you want to call it, in order to justify some belief. How are you going to justify the criterion? Well, you could appeal to another criterion in order to justify the criterion, but if you do that you need to justify the other criterion, and so we get an infinite regress uh, taking off. Um, to avoid the infinite regress, 
You can go back in a circle and appeal to the original criterion. But then you've argued in a circle, and circular justification is not going to provide justification of the original criterion because you're effectively just appealing to the original criterion to support itself. So the third option, it looks like an exhaustive set of options, is just not to play the game. To just adopt the criterion and not provide any rationale for it and just adopt it in a sort of dogmatic way. But if you do that, then it's quite obvious that you haven't justified it, so it's not justified. And that makes it look as if it's not possible to provide a justification for any criterion. That's kind of the skeptical outcome, at which point the Pironian is going to say, we must suspend judgment. Now, I usually call this the problem the criterion, and Chisholm, in the paper I've put in the reader, um, the, the Piper's uh, entitled the problem of the criterion. Um, but there's another word which is often used and that Chisholm tends to use. Uh, it's dialelos or dialelos. Um, and that was the Greek word that when you, you find when you look at um, Sexus Empiricus in, this, in presenting the outlines of um, uh, Peronian skepticism. And the word dialelos means wheel. And why it was used is that. Um, in, when you're justifying the criterion, you get caught in this circle. And go, being on a wheel and going around and around is sort of the metaphor that's being used to get across uh, what goes on when you're um, arguing in a circle. The, the dialelos, the wheel metaphor, is an attempt to get at the idea that you're going around in a circle when you justify the criterion. So he tends to use the word dialelos. He tends to use that word because in thinking about the problem of the criterion, he's focusing more on the issue of circularity than on the infinite regress. Infinite regress doesn't really um, get much time for him. He's thinking about the circle. So in a sense, this might be a slightly different problem from the infinite regress problem, but one way or the other, it's closely related. The way that Chisholm sets this up is um, he's thinking about the question of whether we can identify a criterion for knowledge. And the question is, can you identify a criterion for knowledge without having some way of identifying cases of knowledge, right? So we want a criterion that will enable us to tell whether an item of knowledge is a genuine item of knowledge. And the question is, how could you come up with a criterion? How can you come up with a criterion separately from um, identifying some particular cases of knowledge. The thought is that um, you need to have some way of identi- you, you need to have already identified cases of knowledge in order to be able to identify a criterion. Because how else could you determine whether the criterion is actually identifying cases of knowledge unless you could independently recognize knowledge? So what's being asked is, can we come up with a criterion? Or let's for a moment just say test. Can we come up with a test which would enable us to identify cases of knowledge? Well, how would you do that? In order to find um, a test, right? So you want a test that will enable you to identify cases of knowledge. In order to find a test, you have to determine whether the test is actually working, right? But how can you tell whether the test is able to be used to identify cases of knowledge? You have to be able to show that what the test is doing is identifying cases of knowledge. But then that means you need to be able to identify a case of knowledge and then use that to tell that the, the test is actually working. And the thought is roughly this, that it, if, if you need to have a test to identify a case of knowledge, but then you need to be able to identify pieces of items of knowledge in order to tell whether the test works, you're not going to be able to actually arrive at the test because how do you identify those pieces of knowledge without a test? You needed knowledge to determine whether the test works. You want a test, right? Looks like you're not going to be able to come up with a test for knowledge because you haven't got any way of telling whether the test actually works. You've got no way of telling whether what the test does is pick out pieces of knowledge.
That's the problem that Chisholm is working on. That's the way he's thinking of the problem of the criterion. I'm going to be going through it uh, in his terms now. Um, the way Chisholm sets it up is in terms of these two uh, opposing pairs of questions. Um, he uses this as his version of the problem of criterion and as his way of setting up the problem of uh, skepticism. Um, I don't know whether he would want to say this is the fundamental way of setting up problems in epistemology, but he gets these two sets of, of questions and he plays them off against each other. There's a certain sense in which they have an odd relationship. Um, so the first pair of questions, this is what he calls A, um, and I'll be referring back to this as A, um, is the question, what do we know? What is the extent of our knowledge? Right. So that's the question, which particular things do we know? Right. Do I know that this is a hand? Do I know that this is a classroom? Do I know that this is Monday? Do I know that you know there's an election on Saturday? Do you know these particular things? And that's a question, sort of a substantive question, about particular things that you know. What do you know? That question has not said anything about how you tell whether you know. It's a separate question. Separate question is the question that comes under his B, to uh, second pair of questions, how are we to decide whether we know? What are the criteria for knowledge? Okay? Um, Criteria for knowledge are the kind of things you could use to tell whether you know something. Right? You've got some particular claim, you're interested in knowing whether you know it, and you have a criterion which you use to tell whether it's an actual piece of knowledge. These are two separate questions, separate pairs of questions. The first is, what do you know? What things do you know? The second is, how do you find out whether you know? How do you determine that you have knowledge? So what's the relationship between these questions? I think when you, I'll show this to you, when you think about it, there's a sense in which they have a kind of reciprocal relationship. So let's start off by asking what happens if you were able to answer the first pair of questions on their own prior to answering B, right? So it, can we answer the question, what do you know? Let's start off by saying, yes, let's, we can answer that question. Right? So the question is, what do you know? And we are able to present some particular cases of things that we know. We just do it, right? I know that here's a hand. I know these are glasses. I know I got hair on my head, right? A whole bunch of things I know. Give you a bunch of cases of knowledge. Now, Here's a way in which these two questions are related. If we actually have some items of knowledge, then we can consider those items of knowledge. We can inspect them. We can examine them. We can ask what properties those items of knowledge have. We can find out what properties these items of knowledge have that are distinctive. We can find distinguishing features of items of knowledge. For example, maybe they come from sense experience, or maybe they're a priori true, or whatever. We can look at these items of knowledge and work out what features or properties they have that distinguish them as items of knowledge. So we could actually come up with criteria of knowledge if we could independently come up with cases of knowledge. So if we're able to answer the first pair of questions, right, if we're able to answer that, the top questions, what do we know, we would then be able to arrive at an answer to the second set of questions. Because if we could start with cases of knowledge, we could notice distinguishing features of cases of knowledge, and we could build them up into criteria. And so we could come up with criteria for knowledge based on things that we know. So there is a way of answering the second set of questions if we can answer the first set of que first pair of questions. But what if you couldn't answer the first pair of questions? What if you couldn't just sort of start by answering A? What if you just couldn't do it without a criteria or anything? What if you couldn't do it? Well, In that case, if you didn't have a set of propositions that you know, you wouldn't be in a position 
to inspect these items of knowledge and to propose criteria, right? You'd be unable to come up with a set of criteria that fit those items of knowledge. So if you didn't have an answer to the first pair of questions, then you wouldn't have any way of coming up with an answer to the second set of questions. You couldn't inspect cases of knowledge and say, here's what's distinctive of cases of knowledge, and then develop criteria. You couldn't do that. And the thought is, if you can't identify some cases of knowledge first, then you're not going to be in a position to develop criteria that can be used to identify cases of knowledge. Right? Here I'm really just sort of giving an exposition of Chisholm's thinking about this. This is the part of how he thinks these questions are connected. Now I've been asking what the relationship is, what would happen if you could answer the first pair of questions. We'll go back to the second pair of questions. So now think about these. I wonder whether we can answer them. So the f- second pair of questions is, how do you decide whether we know? And what are the criteria of knowledge? Right. So the thought is, could we try to answer those questions first? Well, suppose you could. Right? Suppose you could start with a criteria. Right? We just... Wherever it comes from, we just come up with some criteria of knowledge first. So let's suppose that we're equipped with some criteria for knowledge. What would that do for us? Well, that would then enable us to answer the first pair of questions. right? If we have criteria for knowledge, we can use the criteria to tell what we know. We take the criteria, we consider any proposition, we determine whether it's a bit of knowledge or not, and if it is, we know that. If it isn't, we don't. That's something we don't know. So we could use an answer to the second pair of questions, right? We could use an answer to those to be, how do we decide whether we know, as a way of answering the first pair of questions. If we have criteria, tests, for determining whether we know something, then we can figure out what we know. Right? So, one possible thing is, would be uh, we start with an answer to the question of what the criteria of knowledge are, and then we use that as a way of determining what we know. So we use question uh, B, the pair of questions B, as a way of answering um, question A. The problem is um, it's not clear how we could provide an answer to B without already having a question, an answer to A. Right? Where would an answer to B come from? So the way Chisholm is thinking about this is that these questions are interconnected. They have a kind of a reciprocal relationship. There's a sense in which um, they uh, presuppose each other. And um, one way of thinking about this, and I guess this is the way Chisholm is thinking about it, is it looks like you're not going to be able to answer one without answering the other. If you answer the question of what, you're not, what you know, you can use that to identify criteria of knowledge. So if you answer the first questions, you can answer the second. But it looks like you need to answer the second in order to answer the first. It looks like you need a test to tell whether you have knowledge on what you know. But again, you know, now we're, now we're in the circle. And this is what Chisholm thinks is going to lead to a kind of skepticism. So, as we says, we can formulate the position of the skeptic on these matters. He will say, you cannot answer question A until you have answered question B. And you cannot answer question B until you've answered question A. Therefore, you cannot answer either question. You cannot know what, if anything, you know. And there's no possible way to decide in any particular case. So the thought is that because of the way these two sets of questions presuppose each other, you can't answer either. Why can't you answer either? Well, because you have to answer the other one first. And you can't answer both of them before you answer the other. Right? That's something that you can do.
So his thought is that there's a kind of skepticism that's generated by trying to answer these two questions, by seeing their connection. Um, because they presuppose each other, you can't answer the one without the other. You can't answer the one prior to the other. And that's going to get you in the skeptical position where you don't know what you know, and you don't know how you can tell whether you know, and you don't know whether you know anything, and you can't tell whether any particular claim, whether it's knowledge or not. But Chisholm doesn't think that we're forced by the relationship between these questions into skepticism. And at this point, he describes two different positions in epistemology. And it's almost as if he thinks these are exhaustive, right? He, he doesn't consider other positions. And these aren't the usual ways of describing positions in epistemology. Um, there's two... There's the skeptical way we've just seen of responding to the relationship between the questions. That says we don't know anything. But there's two other things that you could do, two other ways you could respond. The first is to do to adopt what he calls a Methodist position. It's to endorse a position of Methodism. I'm going to go into this in detail in a moment. Um, and if you do that, what you do is you answer the second pair of questions first. That is, you come up with an answer to the criteria of knowledge, and then you answer the question of what you know. But there's another approach, which he contrasts with the Methodist position. He calls this the particularist approach. And what the particularist does is to start with an answer to the question of what we know. You identify things that you know, cases of knowledge, and then as a separate and secondary question, you go on to ask what the criteria of knowledge are. So you start with what you know, and then you come up with a theory about the nature of knowledge. So... He's actually going to reject skepticism, and he's going to consider these two positions, and he's going to reject Methodism, and what he's going to adopt is particularism, which, as I've said, has some similarities with more. Let's start with Methodism. Uh, why does he use the word? Well, all right, we all know there's a Methodist church and so forth, but Chisholm doesn't mean the word Methodism in the religious sense, right? So he's not using the word uh, in a way that's meant to pick out some religious movement. He's using the word because people who adopt, philosophers who adopt this Methodist position are answering the second set of questions first, and they think that it's possible to identify a method for identifying knowledge, a criterion, a test. And this is primary. And you can do this before you answer the question of what you know. So these people, this position is called Methodist because it proposes a method. A method for identifying cases of knowledge. Method, criterion. He's using method and criterion at this point. is pretty much interchangeable. The idea is that the Methodist thinks we can identify criteria for knowledge independently of and prior to the question of what we know. Now, um, he objects to and he rejects Methodism quite quickly. Um, and... I think you can probably see why. His concern is that the Methodist position is going to wind up being arbitrary. Because if independently of any consideration of what particular things you know, you simply come up with a criterion for knowledge, you've actually got nothing constraining your choice. If you're going to come up with a criteria for knowledge without thinking about what you know, you've, you're just going to arbitrarily choose your criterion, right? So if you start with criterion, you, there's going to be nothing constraining that choice. He thinks it's just going to be an arbitrary choice. You might as well choose one criterion as another. His example of Methodists are actually the classic British empiricists. He talks about Locke and Hume, um, and he talks about how they, as their view of the criteria for knowledge, adopt a criterion of very strict empiricism. 
But then what follows, if you adopt the really strict uh, cri- criterion of empiricism, is that, and this would be, I think he's thinking about Hume specifically here, um, is that all you know is that there are some sensations occurring. You actually don't have any access to physical objects beyond sensations, so you can't actually have any reason to believe that there are any physical objects at all, much less things that are too small for us to see, uh, unobservable entities that are creating observable phenomena, right? All you've got is knowledge of immediate sensation. And the thought would be, um, this has been a, a position that starts with a criterion and then gets us in a bad position, namely one of not knowing even that there were physical objects. So it's an example of starting with a criterion and getting into a bad position because um, the criterion was just adopted and the consequence is you don't know anything. Chisholm rejects Methodism. He thinks this is a mistaken view. He thinks that we should start with what we know, right? So he endorses a particular stance. And what the particularist does, this is where I see the connection with Moore, is think that there are some uncontroversial, uncondentious, unproblematic cases of knowledge. And we start with those. We start by identifying particular, uncontentious cases of knowledge. And I think his best example, his main example, is Moore. Moore holds up one hand and says, here's one hand. I know here, oh, Chisholm modifies Moore slightly. I know here is one hand effectively, and I know here's a hand. So he's, these are claims of what Moore knows when he's holding up a hand and looking at it. These are claims of sort of un- uncontroversial claims of knowledge. And the position then, the particular position, is... We start with what we know, with the particular items of knowledge, particular propositions that we know, and so we do that, and then as a secondary thing, we then ask the question, how do we know? What are the criteria? So you start with what you know, you develop your criteria on that basis. And there's a kind of a, a methodology, in a sense, that he proposes. Even, you know, he's not going to use that word because that's going to sound like Methodism. But the thought is, you start with particular items of knowledge, and now you consider the propositions that constitute those particular items of knowledge, and you examine them. You examine them, you consider them, and what you'll do is, and these are his words, you'll come up, you'll you'll notice that these cases of knowledge have particular properties, and you'll be able to develop criteria of what it is to be epistemologically respectable. You start with case of knowledge, you'll notice that certain kinds of knowledge are based on sense experience, certain kinds of knowledge involve certain kind of reasoning, and you'll develop your account of what it is to be epistemologically respectable, and you'll do that by focusing on the particular cases of knowledge knowledge that you have. Now, notice the point of coming up with these criteria is not to show that we have knowledge. We already have knowledge. right? So we're not trying to show that we have knowledge by coming up with the criteria. We start with knowledge and we come up with criteria as, a, in a sense, a theory about the nature of knowledge. We have knowledge already and we propose criteria which reflect features of those things we already know. Now, I want to uh, bring in something that you I don't think you'll find in Lemos or in um, Chisholm. This is a kind of a comment I'm making, thinking about another book that Lemos has written in which he discusses um, Chisholm and in which he compares Chisholm's uh, view to a, a quite well-known position um, in epistemology but also in philosophy in general. Um, this is an approach to questions about normativity um, which is usually described as reflective equilibrium. Um, John Rawls used this expression in thinking about uh, coming up with a theory of justice. Um, Goldman, Alvin Goldman, will use reflective equilibrium when he's trying to figure out how we should tell um, uh, uh, what what a good theory of justification is. Uh, Nelson Goodman uses it when he's trying to justify induction. Um, What is reflective equilibrium? Well, 
the thought is that in trying to figure out um, the principles that govern something, maybe it's morality, maybe it's justification and epistemology, you know, maybe it's rationality, something like that, in trying to figure out the principles that should govern um, an area of normative concern, an area where we want to be justified either epistemically or morally, um, we have to figure out how to justify principles. How do you do it? Well, the thought is we have some principles that we propose, but we also have particular cases that we're going to apply those principles to. But we're actually going to start with some feelings or some thoughts about some cases that are good instances, say cases of knowledge or cases of morality or something. And we're going to want our principles to fit the cases. So we're going to develop some principles. And we're going to want our principles to fit the cases. But the thought is, reflective equilibrium theorists think, what you do is you propose some principles and you propose some cases and you try to make the principles fit with the cases, but sometimes um, the cases don't fit with the principles. Well, when that happens, sometimes you actually get rid of the, some of the cases. You realize you were wrong about some of the cases and you, make the case, you get rid of some cases that you thought were cases of doing something right and you just sort of accept those cases that the principles pick out. But then sometimes you're not prepared to give up the cases in which case you modify the principles. And what you do is you get these principles and cases and you try to bring them into a kind of a balance, a reflective equilibrium. And you, ha you may have to modify both. And it's a process of mutual adjustment. And what you do is you bring the principles and the cases into balance and at the end of the day you've got a set of principles that you accept because they fit with a bunch of cases that you accept. Um, and if there's some cases you've rejected it's because you decide the principles were right. If there's some principles you change it's because you decide the cases were right. And you get into reflective equilibrium. Well, why I've mentioned this is because that doesn't seem to be what Chisholm is proposing at all. Chisholm doesn't talk about making the criteria and the particular cases of um, uh, knowledge come into reflective equilibrium. He doesn't talk about rejecting the cases in order to make them fit with the criteria. He talks about making the criteria fit the cases. Right? He's a particularist. We start with cases of knowledge. We come up with criteria that fit the cases. He is not talking about giving up the cases uh, in favor of criteria. He's not talking, so far as I can see, about reflective equilibrium. Here's what he says. As particularists, in our approach to the problem of the criterion, we will fit our rules, principles, to the cases. Right? Not otherwise. Not the other way. We'll fit our rules to the cases. Knowing what we do about ourselves and the world, we have at our disposal certain instances which our rules or principles should countenance, and certain other instances which our rules or principles should rule out or forbid. By investigating these instances, we can formulate criteria that any instance must satisfy if it's to be countenanced, and we can formulate other criteria that any instance must satisfy if it's to be ruled out or forbidden. So Chisholm, the way he presents it, we've got the cases, and we're going to come up with epistemic principles that had better fit the cases. He doesn't say anything about getting rid of the cases in the face of the principles. So at least his words don't fit with the reflective equilibrium model. Now, his response, his position, his particularist account is meant to be a solution to the problem of the criterion. So he's going to try to respond to what he's called the dialelus, the, um, the wheel. Um, uh, and the way he wants to do this is by saying that we can answer the question about what we know um, first, right? We start with the question of what we know, we answer that, uh, we then move on to the question of what the criteria are, and um, the thought is that you break in or break out of the circle, in other words, breaking in or breaking out, by starting with what you know. You start with what you know, you identify the criteria, and you don't get stuck, in, you don't get caught in the circle. Now, 
this is in some sense supposed to be a response to the skeptic, right? The skeptic has set this circular problem up, this problem of circularity, and he is saying that we can start with knowledge. We can start with what we know. We start with what we know, we go on to answer the question of how we know based on that. The question is, is this a satisfactory response to the skeptic? Right? Skeptic has pointed out a circularity between uh, the question, uh, circular relationship between the question of um, uh, what we know and, a, and, a, and criteria for knowledge. And Chisholm responds, well, we're just going to start with what we know, and then we're going to invent some criteria that uh, pick out, uh, that distinguish what we know from what we don't know. That's my response to the skeptic, you say. Well, Chisholm is perfectly explicit that his response to the skeptic begs the question against the skeptic. Slightly longer quote. So at the end of his paper, he's just been sort of describing uh, various things we could say about the various criteria. But in all of this, I have presupposed the approach that I have called particularism. The Methodist and the skeptic will tell us that we have started in the wrong place. If now we try to reason with them, then I'm afraid we'll be back on the wheel. What few philosophers have had the courage to recognize is this. We can deal with the problem only by begging the question. It seems to me that if we do recognize this fact, as we should, then it's unseemly for us to try to pretend that it isn't so. One may object, doesn't this mean that the skeptic is right after all? I would answer not at all. His view is only one of three possibilities and it in itself has no more to recommend it than the others do. And in favor of our approach, there is the fact that we do know many things after all. Right? He's, what's in favor of his approach in response to the skeptic is that we have knowledge. Well, you might think that when Chisholm says, okay, well, I'm just going to beg the question against the skeptic, that what he's simply doing is admitting defeat. Can't beat the skeptic, I just have to beg the question against the skeptic. But the skeptic, presumably, um, was trying to challenge the claim that we have knowledge. Skeptic has raised these objections, which are supposed to lead us to think that perhaps we don't have knowledge. And if you respond just by saying, you know, in, res in response to the skeptic, it looks like you just beg the question. And so it looks like this is not going to be something that's going to be a successful response to the skeptic. Try to respond to the skeptic just by saying that you know something seems not to respond to the skeptic's challenge, right? kind of thing we saw going on with more. Well, this isn't something that Chisholm discusses much, but Lemos does. Um, is it ever possible to beg the question in a way that's acceptable? What is it that goes on when somebody begs the question? Well, typically, we talk about begging the question in philosophy where there is a dispute or a debate between opposing parties. And when one party uses an assumption that the other party is disputing, that's an example of begging the question, right? Limos suggests that sometimes it can be legitimate to beg the question. Sometimes when you're in a dispute with an opposing position, sometimes there are situations in which there may be an assumption that is disputed by your opponent, but you can legitimately assume it against them in dispute. When would that be those situations where what you're assuming is actually something that you know, something that you're justified in believing, even though it's in dispute? If you're right 
the thought is this would be a case in which you could be justified, you could be right, this would be acceptable begging the question. Lemos thinks that there can be times when you are begging the question but you are still um, presenting an argument that is rationally conclusive. Right? So he thinks you could actually beg the question and you're begging the question to get your opponent but nevertheless your argument is rationally conclusive. Suppose that we take an argument that has premises that are known and that imply the conclusion to be a rationally conclusive argument. It then seems that an argument could be both question begging insofar as it assumes some premise denied by someone and rationally conclusive insofar as the argument is valid and the premises are known. If begging the question and rationally conclusive are understood in this way, then it's false that no question-begging arguments are rationally conclusive. One might say that Chisholm's defense of particularism is rationally conclusive and question-begging. Since the argument is valid and many people know the premises and yet they involve premises that some have denied. Right? So the thought is, as Limos is suggesting, that Chisholm, even though he's begging the question, knows the things that he's claiming to know. He knows he's ha- he, he has some knowledge. And so, because he's right about that, even though he's begging the question against the skeptic, his argument's going to be rationally conclusive because he's, what, the assumptions he's making are assumptions which are known. Now, um, right, so this is... The thought is that Chisholm's response to the wheel, to the dialelos, is in fact um, a case in which um, uh, the argument is rationally conclusive even though it begs a question. Um, But I think it's pretty obvious that this isn't going to be an effective response in the dispute to the skeptic, right? Because the skeptic is actually denying what Chisholm is assuming. Chisholm's assuming that we have knowledge and the skeptic is challenging that. So even if Chisholm's right that we have knowledge and he assumes this against the skeptic, the skeptic's not going to be persuaded. And what um, Limos thinks is if you provide an argument against a skeptic where you make some assumptions that are correct, and so your argument is rationally conclusive, even though this isn't effective against the skeptic, this may not be a bad thing. Right? This may be something that's okay. Um, here's what he thinks. Chisholm's defense of particularism is in another sense inconclusive. Right? It's rationally conclusive, but it's in another sense inconclusive. Such arguments are inconclusive in the sense that they will not settle or conclude the debate between the particularist, the Methodist, and the skeptic. They might not be rhetorically or dialectically conclusive. But why must we judge the merits of Chisholm's defense of particularism by how well it settles the debate? Why not judge it instead by its appeal to a rational yet uncommitted audience? to a thoughtful and open-minded jury who considers the plausibility of the premises. So what Limos is suggesting in defense of Chisholm is that it's possible for him to be right when he says we know things, and so for his response to skepticism to um, uh, be a good response, even though it begs the question. So it could be a rationally conclusive response to skepticism. And yet, it doesn't persuade. It's not going to be effective against the skeptic. It won't be dialectically or rhetorically conclusive against the skeptic. Right? So it's not going to show the skeptic, not going to persuade the skeptic. But the thought is, the most way of putting it, is that why be concerned about whether you're going to persuade the skeptic? Maybe some neutral party who isn't a skeptic will be persuaded by your claim to have knowledge. Why is it that you have to be able to show the skeptic is wrong? This is a not uncommon kind of strategy against skepticism. We'll see this again in a few weeks um, when I'm looking, we'll be looking at naturalism. Um, We'll see a paper by David Papineau, we'll read a paper by David Papineau 
in which Papineau does roughly the same thing. He says, uh, he tries to justify induction by using induction to argue for the reliability of induction. That's traditionally looked like a circle. Um, but he says, look, it can't be an acceptable standard that we have to be able to show that the skeptic himself, the him or herself, will recognize that they're wrong. That can't be a requirement. What we need to be able to do is provide an account of the reliability of induction, whether or not we can persuade them. So there are people who think you don't have to be able to pre present an effective case that would persuade a skeptic. Last point I want to make. This is um, uh, Lemos in discussing particularism. I see Chisholm as a common sense particular, so there's a lot in common with more. But Lemos points out that there could be other kinds of particularists. Right? So there's a common sense particularist who points to things like, I know I have a hand, I know I have two hands. Well, you could be a Cartesian particularist. Maybe the cogito. I think, therefore I am expresses a particular piece of knowledge. So maybe Descartes was a kind of particularist. Um, or, and Lemos considers, well, you could have a religious fundamentalist particularist who starts with the idea that there's no such thing as evolution. Right? They start with it. Um, there can certainly be different kinds of particularists. One might, for example, be a Cartesian particularist and hold that one's knowledge is confined to one's own existence and mental states to some simple necessary truths and to the epistemic propositions that we know such things. Someone might claim that among the things he knows is that there's been no evolution, that his people have always inhabited the land they now occupy, and that he's God's appointed messenger. Yet he will still be, he still might be a particularist insofar as he held that his knowledge of such epistemic facts did not depend on his knowing any general epistemic principle. All right, so if Limos is right, there could be a lot of different kinds of particularists because particularists can, in a sense, choose the items of knowledge they're going to claim as items of knowledge. Now, I would have thought this was kind of a difficulty for the particularist um, because the way Chisholm has set it up is you answer the question of what you know first and then you do your theory of knowledge. You come up with your criteria. And the idea is that you examine the cases identify distinctive properties and those, th those distinctive properties then become the basis for the criteria. But if you start with completely different sets of particular cases of knowledge, you're presumably going to not come up with the same criteria. And there's not going to be any way you can sort of adjudicate a dispute. Right? If I've got a set of criteria that fit with common sense truths and somebody else has a set of criteria that fits with another set of truths, and we're supposed to start with particular items of knowledge, it's not clear how you resolve a dispute about criteria. So I would have thought that was a problem, but Limos just seems to flag it as a feature of particularism. Okay, um, that's it for particularism. We've got time for questions. Tomorrow I'll be looking at what Limos calls the argument from ignorance, and then uh, two approaches, one which I see as growing out of the other. The first approach is the relevant alternatives theory, um, which is the idea that when you know some proposition, you have to be able to exclude certain alternatives to that uh, proposition, certain things that follow. You need to be able to show that they're false. Um, and the question is, which alternatives do you need to be able to exclude? All of them? Or just the relevant ones? The question is, how do you determine what relevant is, what's relevant? And some people are going to think that's a contextual matter. And so that leads us into the position that's called contextualism. Um, and the contextualist view is basically that when we're talking in ordinary circumstances, it's perfectly right to say that we know something. So Moore is right about ordinary common sense. But then once we start considering skeptical scenarios, it's no longer the case that we do know something. 
the context has shifted. So we can use the word no in one context, but then we won't apply it in a slightly different context. Um, and the thought then is that knowledge is in some sense sensitive to what particular context you're working in. And you might surprisingly find that on the one hand, you are perfectly correct to say that you know in ordinary circumstances, but the minute you start considering skeptical scenarios, you have to retreat and say, oh no, we don't really know. But that's because the word no uh, doesn't work the same way in all contexts. It's sensitive to context. That's for tomorrow. Got a few minutes for questions. Yes, and then... In, in some ways, the particularists, the, the, the problems that arise with particularism look part of it like the same sort of issues that we saw with um, strictly coherentist theories, don't they? Because if you, if, if, if knowledge depends on my starting point and where I happen to be, then presumably I can put together my reality without reference to anything else necessarily. And my knowledge that the, you know, the CIA, the KGB, and the FBI are all forming a book from the Alliance out to get me, and that that's yeah. as good as my. Yeah, so I, my I, I agree. That, that bit that Limos mentions, I, th I think, was a bit more problematic. I, I think, I mean, for me, the real particularist is the common sense particularist. Um, but this is this does seem, seem to be a problem if you're going to just start with items of knowledge. Uh, how is it that? We're going to avoid an arbitrary starting point. I think more, and I think Chisholm as well, um, are assuming somehow that there won't be this arbitrary starting point. They're, they're thinking that common sense is going to be picking out a whole body of basic bits of knowledge, and that that's going to sort of be, um, uh, you know, that's what they're thinking about. They're, they weren't anticipating this thought, well, you could have a whole other set of particular instances of knowledge. Um, so that's. To me, that's a, a kind of a, a worry about particularism. Um, yep, Nick. Um, so, when we're talking about the problem of the, cri um, of the criteria, and we've got the three responses, and one of them is a circular argument, can you take the same response that a coherentist would and say that it's only a problem if you have a linear justification, or a linear conception of it? And if we take a non-linear conception, then it won't be a circle, but it will kind of just intermingle like a crossword. So that would be another way, yes. Yeah, um, is that possible? So in a sense, um, it looks like the way Chisholm sets it up, which is a bit classical um, in terms of the choice between infinite rest, circularity, and, and, and not prov providing an argument or any um, ground. Um, there is an alternative he doesn't consider. It's the, it's the coherentist way, which is to say, um, look, maybe there's a mistaken conception of justification here. Um, I do see that as a way of, uh, as relevant. Well, I'm just not sure if it, if it works for the way Chisholm is trying to set it up. Um, I don't know whether this is whether we can do this with the foundationalist versus the versus the um, the coherent. Just look at the the pair of questions that Chisholm sets up. It's the relationship between these two pairs of questions that he thinks has that that reciprocal relation. Um, I agree that in responding to the choice between circularity, infinite regress, and stopping. Maybe you could say that that was the, that we should go coherentist or something. But the reaction to these two questions, where there's a the question is which do you answer first? It's not obvious to me that the, that the coherentist line helps us yet. If the thought is, you, do you answer one before the other? You can't answer one before the other. That's not. It's, you, you, you can't answer them both before the other. And that was a skeptical thought. Um, so the thought, and, and if you wanted to respond, you had to say, well, we can answer one before the other. Chisholm's thought is, if you answer the second one before the other, it's arbitrary. You can answer the first one. That'll maybe you answer the second one, but then it begs a question. And the question is whether there is any such thing as allowable question begging. Does some, uh, Chisholm clearly refers to the common sense word of that the hand yeah. examples, which are sort of static and external objects and so forth. But uh, I'm just wondering, 
the thing seems to borrow a little bit further in the sceptic argument is that action theory, that idea that sceptics themselves are breathing, living, moving, sure, yeah. getting food. Does Chisholm ever refer to that? I don't think he does. Not in the public criterion. Um, I wouldn't know whether they, some of these people wrote massively. Um, so I, uh, but I mean, in, in, in the stuff that I'm familiar with where he talks about this, it, this, this is the, the way he thinks about it. Um, so what you were thinking, to, uh, so what, one response that people sometimes give to the Peronian is that we're supposed to suspend belief. But if we say suspend belief, how can we actually ever engage in action because an action is based on belief, and if you don't have belief, you're not going to be able to act. Um, in a sense... Chisholm sort of short circuits it by not actually going down the track of, of, um, of, of addressing the actual Peronian suspension. He just extracts from their problem this question. And then even the way he sets up skepticism, he says the skeptical response is you can't answer either because you need to answer, need to answer the, the one before the other. And so you can't know what you know and you can't tell how you know, and you can't use criteria to tell, you know, so it's a skeptical outcome, but it's not actually the, the literal Peronian position he's dealing with. He's taking something from them, 